right here too. We tell people their seats. There's a couple seats up here if people are looking to sit down. Another one here. No, too much commitment. <laughs> nice to see you. So we'll go ahead and get started if we're ready. Um, I'm, I'm Jennifer Puentes, a professor in sociology, and I'm very excited to introduce for her first colloquium with us, uh, Susan Murrell, uh, assistant professor, I'm sorry, associate professor of art and a very proud mother of our favorite dog, dog. EOU dog. <laughs> Amiga, yes. Trick, We're yeah. always talking about <laughs> dogs. If you know me, you know that's exactly what I'm talking about. My mom got nervous. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I was fortunate to meet your wonderful dog before I got to meet you, and it's only been better since uh, I've got to meet you since you've come back from sabbatical to share your research with us. So her large scale and site-specific installations, paintings, and works on paper have been exhibited nationally. Um, in the fall of 2016, Mural was the artist in resident at Portland State University's Studio MFA program, resulting in a solo exhibition at the Ozen Gallery in Portland entitled uh, We Are All Cosmic Dust. Other solo exhibitions include Embedded at the Pendleton Center for Arts in Oregon, uh, The Matter at the International Gallery of Art in Anchorage, Alaska, Aerial Density at the Portland International Airport, and Shell at Whitman College in Walla Walla in Washington. She has received multiple Golden Spot and Mid-Career um, mid Artist Awards through the Ford Family Foundation, and in 2017 won the Oregon Arts uh, Commission Career Opportunity Grant. Um, for people who haven't been, we just kind of, when we go to the question portion, just wait, raise your hand, and we'll come around um, just so that people online streaming can hear your questions so we know what everyone's responding to. And on that, I'll go ahead and turn it over. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. I'll stand about here. Wow, thank you for coming. I know it's midterms. There are um, exams to grade, papers to write, all that sort of stuff so um, thanks for coming I wanted to start out by thanking our awesome uh, gallery staff our student workers that helped me install the show yeah and they do um, they work as uh, docents and we have a fantastic ringleader their gallery director this year Audrey Lynn is doing a really great job of course Corey Peak makes sure it all runs smoothly behind the scenes so thank you um, I'm gonna start uh, today by just talking about some reoccurring themes in my work to so that some of you might um, that haven't seen my paintings before or installations will know what I'm what I feel like I'm dealing with in most of my um, uh, work and then jump into my experiences and travels in the next this last year I know some of you are curious some of the students want to know where I was and then too just how those experiences and travels affected uh, what my creative work what the content is and what direction I feel like it's going in. Um, I forgot to grab the clicker. Ah, there we go. It buzzed, there we go. So um, I'm showing this painting by Mary uh, Emily Carr, who uh, landscape painter, because I feel like I'm a landscape painter. I feel like I'm part of the landscape painting tradition in a lot of ways. Um, what I'm dealing with, though, is how I feel uh, that landscape, our sense of landscape has changed through technology. Aerial views of planets um, and even microscopic views of uh, cellular structures have kind of infused in our visual vocabulary about the world around us and the world inside us. I would throw in the landscape, too, graphic design and illustration, things that have kind of permeated our consciousness about who we are and our place in the universe. Topographic lines of maps, we see those all the time. Uh, the shift, this shift in scale, the microcosm, macrocosm, has allowed us as well to see these patterns in nature, like the branching of a river delta or the branching that we see in lungs. So um, kind of recognizing those patterns. And of course, 
we're more aware of, of, human, of our own impact on the landscape as we fly over it all the time now. It's kind of a, um, a annu annual, if not weekly, occurrence for a lot of us to get an aerial view of the world that we live in. Um, another uh, theme that seems to uh, carry forward is my interest in materiality. Uh, just materials themselves and how they're used uh, and the difference between a, um, a some sort of inherent logic that occurs within some material. This one I showed, uh, I'm showing a, a painting of Nicole Eisenman's coping because I remember seeing this painting in upstate New York in a museum, like kind of probably in your way over there. Um, this, this painting struck me for many reasons and I had always seen it in projection, which you're seeing it now, and it just doesn't do it justice because when you're in front of it, you realize that the, I feel like the most important thing that she did with this painting is that the muck the people are moving through, um, the paint itself became the muck. So instead of using paint as a tool to illustrate things, it actually became the substance that the characters were kind of struggling against as they moved through it. It was nice and thick, huge brush strokes, and, um, and just popped right off of the canvas. So in my painting process, I know some of you are curious about how these uh, came into being. I've used v various ways of blowing stuff around and <laughs> letting it dry for years, but right now I've been, um, I roll out large sheets of um, polymer paper and use these cups of watercolor, different colors, and I'm making these watercolor pores that are just big, huge areas of color. Sometimes they're muddy, not very interesting, but what happens over time is uh, the pigment suspended in the watercolor, of course, is just pig is just uh, little particles. So some of them are heavier than others. Some are um, are or inorganic uh, pigments are tend to stain the water and suspend it longer. So over time, as they dry, when you're seeing in my paintings areas that there are these fine lines of detail that happen through a, a spontaneous and natural process. It's using s evaporation and um, gravity to depict a concept which I'm interested in, which is the natural world. It's just a really nice fit for me. There's a good, uh, a nice confluence of the idea and the material itself. Similarly, you've seen over the years, I use a lot of uh, black sign vinyl and black tape. For me, that has to do with, that's a reference, a visual reference for this graphic design world that we live in. And depicting the sign vinyl, for me, wants to move in a grid. That's its inherent logical uh, movement. It wants to create things that might look like housing developments or uh, circuit board. If the line gets thin enough, maybe it would um, have the movement and dexterity to be able to become that topographic line. So uh, I really think about materials a lot and try to uh, use them, I don't know, how they want to move, as if they're characters. So with that background, I'll jump into a little bit about where I was. In the summer of 2016, when my sabbatical started, I spent most of the summer um, involved with an organization called Signal Fire which is uh, a nonprofit arts organization that takes artists and creative agitators into our remaining wild lands. So there's a lot of um, art, art and activism coming together within this organization. And I was um, a part of it in three different ways. This is a library from one of our campsites. Um, and we read all sorts of essays. They do a really good job of culling readers for people to give us um, some context and uh, expose us to material that we might not other otherwise. Uh, some of this is art literature, of course, but we also um, learn, read about learning through the indigenous experience. I read excerpts from John Wesley Powell's um, travels through the canyon lands and um, various essays on environmental uh, theory in the end, a lot of that for me, or the most poignant parts, was really looking at the concept of wilderness and what we consider wilderness. Um, 
and the the problem that or the um, the trap that's inherent with traditional and dualistic thinking of man versus nature as if human beings aren't a part of nature so the first one that I was involved with in was uh, outpost residency and I was actually an assistant I helped cook dinner I took them out on um, little adventures on my inflatable paddleboard things like that um, I took uh, I then joined a group that was doing and this is uh, actually a class there was about 10 students and we backpacked in the bitter roots uh, we were in Idaho on the Selway River um, and this they got they got uh, college credit for this through Oregon College of Art and Craft and just a just a revelation for me to be able to hold class on this um, <laughs> on this beach and uh, to talk about these concepts and make work too so finding out that was another theme throughout the summer was how do you make work when you're outside of the studio how do you think like an artist when you're outside of the studio a lot of it came to ephemeral works and um, different ways of thinking not being as attached to making objects when there's there's not a, um, a plethora of paper and any paint you can imagine and then I finished out the summer with a trip uh, down the Green River. And in that capacity, I was one of the artists in the group. And we just had a fantastic canoe trip. Um, it was 10 days, lots of hikes into the rim, the canyon lands, and amazing fire time discussions at night. So transition. This is, I think, the first documented experience experience I have with death and mortality here. My dad is coming home with a, um, from a duck hunt. That's me with the hand. Um, and I bring this up because uh, as a lot of you, as I move into explaining some of the themes behind um, a few of my pieces, um, a lot of you know because you're part of my community that uh, years ago, my, my partner of 14 years was diagnosed with ALS and then passed away two years later. So there was a long time and then also just a heartbeat of time of looking into the abyss and really you know, considering the unknown. So this piece over here, uh, We Are All Cosmic Dust, was um, kind of came out of that journey of considering um, what was happening both to his body as it deteriorated, but then also how, um, how we were uh, approaching the entire transition of his life from this world to another, um, and, and not really knowing, but also wanting to see those as possibilities, as positive possibilities. So I was coming up with lots of images about um, collecting images of cracks and openings. Uh, it felt like a portal to me. This piece I created uh, years before this experience, but I kept coming back to it. It's a uh, lithograph that I did at uh, Crow's Shadow, um, which is over in the Umatilla Reservation, an amazing printmaking studio. Uh, this is a lithograph. But uh, we're trying to get this impression of a wall cracking or a paper tearing and then the universe on the other side. So I wanted some cosmic mystery that kind of um, enveloped all of it. I also thought back to a piece I did at the Pendleton Center for the Arts where they have this funky wall. It's a movable wall, kind of like this one, but it's actually um, sunk into a space to connect two areas. Um, and my first instinct was to put one thing right in the center of it, and then I thought, well, that kind of makes it over important. And I really, um, when I found out that I, when I discovered, or actually it told me what to do, <laughs> that the installation itself should emerge from the crack and move into the space other ways and leave that space empty. Um, I kind of, it was a revelation to me. It was one of the smartest things I think I did with that show. So um, I was thinking of emptiness and places for us just to rest our eye, just to think um, and be okay with not knowing. At the same time, I'm stumbling upon this dark blue-black that um, you see in a lot of my paintings around here. And it reminded me of images like this. This is from the New York Times talking about the um, Arctic shelf that was uh, that was cracking and falling off. And then also just the abyss, you know, foreverness. 
Um, this time, I'm going to, I was reading um, and I've run into this. Uh, Jamie actually turned me on to Rebecca Solnit, and I spent most of my sabbatical reading every single one of her books. She maybe, sh maybe will marry someday, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> but she, this book is wonderful. It's, it's more about uh, on the political activism side of things, but everything that she says is just so heart-wrenching and personal. It's, I feel like it's applicable on so many multiple levels. So, um, so this was resonating for me. To hope is to gamble. It's to bet on the future, on your desires, on the possibilities that an open heart and uncertainty is better than gloom and safety. To hope is dangerous, and yet it is the opposite of fear, for to live is to risk. So I'm in Portland now from my adventures of being in a tent all summer long, and I'm in Portland for a good um, two months, and starting to paint using that blue-black, finding the edges, creating my cracks, figuring out how these composite um, paintings can create a space for um, contemplation. At the same time, one other thing that I had in mind was, as you see the sculptural elements that I have here, they first came into my work, um, I feel like, almost as a formal element. I was using so many of those black lines, I wanted the line to be more animated. I wanted to pop out of the ground all of a sudden and become three-dimensional. I'm hoping and um, that in some of that transition that things might feel like they're growing or seeping into the floor, that change is happening. Um, but I came up with this idea of just wrapping some gallery pedestals with sign vinyl to create the, the black line, um, and these shapes. And I thought they were a pretty enigmatic when I made them. Um, I felt like they might be pedestals or they might be um, command centers <laughs> or um, little, little seats of meditation. I didn't know. I thought they were just weird and I liked them. They also reminded me of uh, uh, John McCracken's work, who's a very famous uh, minimalist sculptor. And these are high fab um, items, highly manufactured, really beautiful, shiny sculptures. Some of my Art 101 students might remember them, one from the Portland Art Museum. Um, so there was also kind of a tongue-in-cheek reference there for me, which I like the <coughs> lo-fi um, sticker and acetate <laughs> um, rendition of a, of a John McCracken cube. Another is 2001 Space Odyssey. At the very end with the monolith, you know, and everybody has their own theories about what does it mean? What was the monolith at the very end? Students, if you haven't seen it, it's time this weekend time. So yeah, um, is it where people go when they've uh, achieved an elevated consciousness? Is it some sort of um, tra you know, um, tra transporter? Uh, we're not quite sure. Is it delivering something? Is it taking us away? So at this point, I'm completely fascinated with these weird things I've made. It's not like I think they're great sculptures in and of themselves. I just think they, they were capturing my imagination. And of course, there was, uh, well, there is an endless list of both uh, heartwarming and uh, simultaneously uh, heartbreaking and hilarious things that happen when you're dealing with a terminal illness. And one was when I'm signing the contract with the funeral home, and it says that um, ashes will be delivered to me in a durable plastic container. <laughs> what? A durable plastic container? Like a Ziploc? Or you know, is it going to have a lid? I actually asked those follow-up questions <laughs> just because I wanted to know what was coming through the door. That came through the door. And I, then I pretty much knew Doug was pulling my leg from the other side. <laughs> so the, the black box. I also discovered this beautiful painting by Hilma of Klint in um, Sweden. She's an abstract painter that has been really overlooked by the canon. She, this is painted maybe 1905 or 1910. Um, beautiful work. I, um, we've just acquired one of her books in the library. Um, but so she's, she was part of the spiritualist movement, uh, so was perhaps didn't fall in line exactly with um, what some of the early abstract uh, painters were dealing with. 
but she was also female, so who knows why she didn't get her due, but to check her out. So this, these ideas came over into the piece that you see, which I do consider it one piece, the insta painting installation on this side of the gallery. We are all cosmic dust. Um, and I first exhibited them at PSU. The floor elements, too, for me, uh, a shorthand about change, rubble. Um, I don't expect it to be a faux job as if, as if uh, um, it's not a Universal Studios type thing where you're going to believe the floor is cracking. But um, just like a visual shorthand that things change, whether these are pushing out of the floor or falling back in. Uh, also, being in Portland, I can't help but reference the, the big earthquake that at some point will happen, but we all can't really fathom. The leather remnants in here, um, I have a, a wonderful friend, um, Dana Hinger, that owns um, Spool Town, which is a, a sewing company, and she gives me different materials based on what I'm looking for. And this t I asked her if she had any leather specifically for this piece, the smell of it, um, the color. I wanted it to reference bodies. So jump from this work into um, a little bit more about where I was um, and where I was making work through the year. This is my Portland studio. And this is when I got going. <laughs> you can see some of the watercolor pores on the ground and um, some studies of different crack shapes. You know, um, <coughs> I was drawing cracks for a long time to figure out how all that fit together. My first um, residency after PSU was at uh, Playa, which is in South Central Oregon in Summer Lake. Um, do you see this, this uh, photo is almost uh, a little confusing, but I was hiking up on a hill, and this is actually the residency. So there's a lot of little cabins down here and a big um, lodge house, artists and writers all working and visual artists all working together. Um, and then as you go up here, this, that's actually a water that's reflecting the sky above. So Summer Lake is a dry lake bed. It fills up to some extent during the winter, but um, in the summer dries up. Notice what that one looks like. It's a wonderful little live workspace. This is an installation that they have, a permanent installation on the playa. And this is one of the dust storms. The weather was incredible over there. So um, the floor really picked up. I mean, it looked like it was just coming to assume us all. Another residency I had in the winter time was uh, over Caldera, which is near Sisters in Oregon. Um, and it's right near a Caldera Lake. I, um, some of the artists have these nice little A-frame cabins for some reason, scheduling or whatever. I ended up in the lodge, which was great. I was the only person in the lodge. So sometimes it was a bit creepy. I could um, reenact uh, the shining and stuff down the hallway, <laughs> all by myself. But um, this is one of the hikes, a lot of time outside. And then um, in the spring, I was overseas for two months. Um, traveled around a lot by myself, you know, doing the big city thing and seeing lots of museums and um, natural history museums and art museums. But this is an image from um, Iceland. I was at in the West Fjords at the West Fjords residency. Uh, this little cottage, I lived with a couple other roommates. Um, it was a tiny village. And we were, um, this was my studio, which was pretty posh, beautiful hardwood floors. I was a little nervous about that. It was actually this village lost their bank. The bank closed. So the bank building now is being inhabited by the artists, which that's OK with me. I, I can live with that connotation. This was my view from that, that area right out into the, the water, watching the, the boats in the fog come and go. This is, I put the bike here because it's my, it was my biggest, one of my biggest memories from Finland. So I went to a residency, Artilis, in Finland, and they had these cruiser bikes that we could all use. So we would go out on these adventures. We were, um, the whole group of residents were um, 
we would take the bikes out and I kind of felt like, you know when you had a, an adventure when you were in elementary school and you were all kind of taken over the neighborhood with your bike, that's how I felt. Um, we would find all these little lakes. There was about eight, eight small lakes right within 30 minutes of a bike ride from the residency. And we were in an abandoned schoolhouse. So the schoolhouse had sold and become artist studios. Um, that was a, we actually had a one large shared studio space, uh, but I got to take over a lot of it because there were a lot of new media people, people on their computers <laughs> and <laughs> um, uh, musicians that were recording things in their bedrooms and stuff and writers, so people that didn't, aren't as messy and don't take up as much space as I tend to. So the big thing I wanted to talk about with um, Artilles, though, is that it was a themed residency, which I've never done before. Uh, the theme was Back to Basics, and they were uh, trying, which I signed up for it, I knew what I was getting into, but um, they didn't want distractions. They were just like, see what it's like for a month of uh, making your art with no cell phone and no internet. So we all turned in our phones and there was no um, communication. And uh, We also had twice daily meditation times at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., which was amazing just to have that long of a spread where it was that, that consistency and really spending the time to be able to sit. Um, I'm always uh, very much a beginner and a dabbler, but to have that, that intensity and space and encouragement to be able to meditate for that many uh, minutes every day was, was wonderful. The big thing about residencies though, especially I'm kind of just saying this for our students, is how much uh, community building happens when you're at one. Um, you're going on hikes, having adventures. This one is from the Green River. We're hiding from the sun in a cave that we found. <coughs> and then also just talking about your work with other artists from all around the world. Um, this is a new friend, Simon, uh, from China. And uh, learning about each other's process, cross-disciplinary too. Some residencies are very specific as to what you're doing, but uh, the ones I like to go to have writers and musicians um, as well, because I, I learn so much and find so many parallels between um, how they work on things and what they're thinking about. Collaborations kind of um, happen through this process too, and lots of dinner parties. And this, <laughs> so there are a lot of goofy selfies. I'm just including one. I was traveling by myself, so you got that or landscapes. But um, this, this uh, very springy, beautiful Icelandic um, moss that's covering the, the, this huge f lava field um, was just an amazing and weird place to be. I, when I first went to Iceland, I had a friend that had been before, and she said, it's like Hawaii and Alaska had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was great. And it was. It was. Um, hikes all the time and just kind of soaking in the area that I'm surrounded by. Um, Iceland has this eerie beauty. You know, there's the geothermal pools, and where I was in the West Fjords, they look like this, just constant mountains and fing with these inlets, so just these fingers coming out into the ocean. Um, but what I didn't really realize until I was there was that the early settlers actually denuded Iceland. They needed wood for heat, and they didn't know how harsh the climate was and how long it would take to actually uh, regrow the forests. <laughs> So it, um, I mean, it's stark and amazing. And I know um, certainly it's a different, uh, different area than, than the Pacific Northwest where I'm trying to stop my garden from growing so I can <laughs> deal with it. But, um, but it's kind of, again, it, to me, it reminds me of um, how we don't really know what might happen until it happens, or we just lack the imagination to even fathom that something could be gone of that sort of magnitude. Um, so in this, I started thinking about and incorporating in my mind the thought when I'm using this black, um, this black area is absent presence. And I'll read a little from um, Annie Prue from The Barkskins, which was a fun read. Um, she was 
uh, when, you, when you pry a sunken stone from the ground, the shape of the stone is still there in the hollow, absent presence. So it's like trying to understand something through its absence. This, uh, this picture is of one of the artists that I was, I was in Finland with, uh, Mahari Killen, and she's a Gaelic um, scholar and turned me on to another woman that I was reading, Meg Bateman. This is a studio visit with her when she read this very excerpt that really affected me. We had had a lot of, talk, uh, lot of talks about um, different uh, ideas of um, the other world or um, uh, magic and superstition and beliefs like that and how it related to the environment. And here, this is from uh, Meg Bateman, the, Ga the Gaelic scholar. My own view is that fairies are mythical mediators between man and nature in its wild state. They are avatars of the other world, of all that is mysterious about our existence. We do not have to believe in the culture-specific form they take to understand the process of negotiation between man and nature and what can go wrong when the negotiation goes wrong. Global warming, flooding, loss of biodiversity. There is nothing fanciful about the, that debate. And then I was up in space. No, I wasn't. I didn't go that far. This is a picture from NASA. I didn't take this one. Um, it's just here to remind me to talk uh, at the same time I um, came in contact with a, a documentary, it's short, 20 minutes or something, called The Overview Effect. I think there's a, a, lot, there's a book that goes along with it. I haven't read it yet, but um, basically The Overview Effect is, um, is, is a term that's been coined from a phenomenon uh, that has happened to a lot of astronauts who go out into space. The idea that um, they have this uh, spiritual and um, spiritual event occurs, a, a shift in consciousness about um, our relationship and the interconnectedness between um, humans and the cosmos and the planet itself. And I just found that fascinating, especially coming from these scientists at the top of their field um, on a mission to go out to do something. And it's when they look back that their life changes. They look back and they t used words about um, uh, phrases like that they felt like the planet was a pulsating organism, that you really get in touch with the life and everything that's happening on, on the planet. Um, and then also the fragility, of course, of seeing the ozone layer and just how how minute it is. So I thought that was really, um, really a beautiful um, uh, look at things. And incorporating all that, a little bit of magic and organism, <laughs> uh, these these empty shapes, uh, these cracks and holes, portals to move through, became islands. And switching that negative, positive space um, was important to me. So I started seeing them as, as different kind of creatures. I put this, this shot in just because I thought you might want to see a work in progress about how I, I kind of start my, um, my image. I'm taking what's there and cutting things apart and then putting them back together. Um, Finding nice, you know, relationships between one shape and one edge, um, but not necessarily. I don't want to ever want it to be matchy matchy. I like the shift in color and texture. Maybe it was a. Um, it reminds me of Google Earth or some sort of composite image uh, that where you might take things in the different uh, weather patterns or a different time of day. And it's. I also like that um, when when you put that really dark color around it, um, it, it leaves it up for the viewer to complete the piece, um, fill in the blanks between one area and another and kind of uh, believe that it's all one thing. So uh, I like the idea that um, our brains have to work to kind of make the image come together in some way or overlook some dissonance to make it one image. And two um, shorelines 
areas I'm more and more in, interested in how um, not necessarily empty space or po uh, positive or negative space, but how just the fact of articulating this slight edge um, pulls this back and forth between what is the object um, and what is the negative space. In the front of the gallery, uh, there's some pieces I call seed clouds, little drawings. And again, I was looking at a lot of, this is from that same uh, um, article in the New York Times about the Arctic shelf, I believe, um, and measuring the crack. I love how um, slight and kind of helpless that line is <laughs> in the midst of such a large, large and um, yeah, large phenomenon and powerful force. So I wanted with these that started out as these just little experiments to just kind of go in and dissect, um, measure, um, just slightly react to what was happening to those drawings. And if water has its way, um, gosh, if water has its way, there was an Anthony, Anthony Dower book um, about grace that I read. One of the characters in there, and I didn't write down the exact words, but said something to the effect of, if water has its way, it will scour all of the mountains um, and create till the earth is a smooth globe and we're all standing in three feet of water. <laughs> um, I love the idea that water has a sense of agency, first of all, and I think it's just a beautiful image in general. And I was a, around a lot of water this whole time, um, kind of magical places, shorelines, and the push and pull of um, the destructive and regenerative force of it. Um, of course, all the museums I went in, this isn't from a museum, this is a tour shop, but um, talked about the Vikings and the belief that uh, water was a gateway to Valhalla. Um, never marry a Viking. I mean, you can date him, but he might want to take you with him in the end, is what I learned. <laughs> um, ice. This is a picture from BC. Didn't mention that trip, but that was fun. I, I weeped there. Waterfall in Iceland. Two, oddly, so this is a, a pool uh, geothermal pool in Iceland. Of course, they have the hot pots, so there's a lot of geothermal thermal activity. And um, it struck me, I didn't plan this, but I went to two countries that have major bathing rituals. Um, a water is a daily, if not weekly, thing that you do with friends. So in Iceland, all of the soaking tubs, um, even in small towns like Thingri, that little village that I lived in, the old people of the village would go down and they'd get free coffee at the community pool and sit around in their bathing suits and kind of gossip about what was happening <laughs> and um, spend some time between laps ta catching up. Um, so water, um, the heat of it, uh, and two, it's like a self-care ritual and also um, a community thing. I'm, this is a picture of the sauna that was at the residency that I attended in Finland. So we, this was a wood fire sauna that we um, fired up every couple nights probably. But in Finnish culture, it's at least once a week on a Friday afternoon evening, you gather your family and friends together and heat up the sauna and you go in and out and in and out of a long process of um, sweating and chatting and go outside and cool down and drink a beer and chat some more and you go back in. So I just found it really fascinating, um, again, uh, following the theme of water. One of my favorite things in the world is to go to natural history museums in uh, countries where English is not the primary language. Because um, everything is just a visual uh, maze. You just kind of figure things out. Instead of the tag telling you what something is depicting, you know, it takes a while. Oh, sorry, I clicked off that. So that was, of course, the percentage of water that the human body is filled with. There was also a picture of a chicken or a, and a sculpture of a pineapple right next to it. Um, so I've been playing around in my studio. Uh, I did one, one piece in Finland, If Water Has Its Way, about um, you know water starting to, I'm using this mylar as a reflective surface to kind of represent that. Um, 
And uh, so that's where I am now in the studio, playing with ideas about water. Um, I think I'm drawn to, you know, again, this idea that it's uh, uh, something that can sculpt and change, um, something that per does permeate us and the world that we're in, that we're kind of afraid of it in terms of its powers of destruction, but it also is something that we rely on and need and is made up of us. So uh, for me, it's about um, uh, feeling a bit ungrounded. And that reminded me, you know, floating ungrounded, of a passage from um, Living Beautifully with Uncertainty and Change by Pima Chodron, wonderful book. <coughs> But we don't have to close down when we feel groundlessness in any form. Instead, we can turn, to, turn toward it and say, this is what freedom from fixed mind feels like. This is what freedom from closed heartedness feels like. This is what unbiased, unfettered goodness feels like. Maybe I'll get curious and see if I can go beyond my resistance and experience the goodness. So thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, and we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. If you want to just raise your hand, and I'll come around with the microphone. No questions. I answered it all. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Peer pressure. OK, so um, my first question was, I read about your work a little bit earlier when I visited the uh -huh. gallery, and I was interested in and you answered it a little bit, but I was interested in how you, because these are obviously smaller pieces that are put together, and mm -hmm. I was wondering, is this like a, was it like a jigsaw puzzle? Did you create these pieces and then look where they went? Or you said you sometimes cut them, but yeah. it seems to me that they're obviously not put back exactly where you cut them from. Right. So I was just wondering a little bit, if you could speak a little bit more about that process, how you made the choice. And sure. how some of them seem so perfect, like the black here mm -hmm. matches perfectly with this black, but the upper part doesn't right. exactly. So it's like if you had a puzzle piece, you go, oh, almost, but this isn't quite, quite the right there. piece. Exactly. And yet, yeah. it's, you were talking about the sort of the dissonance that's uh -huh. there a little bit. And yeah. so just if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, so. Uh, all of these, I, I actually buy my paper in, um, it's like a six foot roll and a 60, 50 feet long. So I roll it on the floor that way. So it's a really large piece of paper to start with. Um, and I find really in areas that I find of interest, things where um, it's a spontaneous process and I've been doing it for years. So I have a th more control than I had when I started, but um, it's still, things happen that I don't know will happen. Um, so I cut pieces out where I find that there is an interesting edge. And I do play around with what edge matches where. I, again, I don't, I want it to feel like it's of the same world, but maybe a different day. <laughs> um, or uh, one thing that I find interesting when I'm looking at the work, and maybe some of you experienced it, is uh, being so drawn by the, the dark value um, that you kind of aren't conscious of the different lines and the different elements of the color until you recognize them like that's kind of a second thought so um, again as humans we're meaning makers we're always connecting the dots and kind of making shapes come together in some way so I like that that's actually happening in somebody's brain as they're looking at them um, but two, I do feel like it's a reference to the composite imagery that we, um, when we go beyond what we can perceive or that our technology can perceive in one scope, you know, we're taking images of different things at different times or different angles and then kind of pasting them all together. And there can be those strange little differences that happen. So part of it's that too, yeah. Um, and I do, another thing I like about it is that um, I, I really enjoy the idea of modular art. <laughs> and um, there's even a few pieces over here that I showed in Finland in different ways, um, different configurations. I usually make a map, and like for these pieces, I was attached to their shape. So I made a map so I would remember what went where. But um, for some of these, uh, 
Well, for the back two pieces, I actually created, put those together just for this gallery. So um, they were shapes that I just kind of laid out and figured them out there. Yeah. Thanks. So do you have a question? I have one other one. Yeah. The other question had to do with control, and you talked a little bit about it, but I'm really fascinated by the idea of you kind of start the creative process and then you let evaporation and mm -hmm. moisture, water, and time kind of complete it or finish the process. Yeah. But you talked a little bit about you have more control than before. And obviously when you look at these, there's definitely some elements of control in that you chose what colors to put down. Even sure. The black I stuff. know what pigments but do, what pigments are really heavy and will fall to the, to the ground yeah. faster. But you would uh, definitely have more control than me, but I was just fascinated by this idea. How much, yeah. is, it, how much is it letting go? How much control do you actually have over the... I, well, I really, um, I think things are going right in the studio if I'm surprised. <laughs> if I know what I'm doing um, to, and have that, and I know what it's supposed to look like, what's the point? So, um, so I do like in, you know, putting a spontaneous process in the mix. Um, I also can and do at times get really fussy with a brush. So I'm not into faux fussiness. Um, I feel like, you know, uh, well, as a matter of practicality too, it could take me years to paint and I, with little, you know, I'd have to make brushes out of little fairy eyelashes, you know, and paint these little tiny, tiny lines over and over and over again. Um, and what's the fun in that when the, I don't know, the, the world does it for me. So, so the detail and those little fine lines come from somewhere else. Sometimes I place things in the watercolor pool and it, um, it evaporates in different ways um, so that it, it clings to things. There's a lot of like um, tangerine, uh, plastic tangerine uh, netting, things like that. So, or string, different, I've played with different elements to get different lines too. But yeah, I like, I enjoy when, um, <coughs> when I've created something that's almost so, so weird or out of um, the ordinary that I don't know how to pull, that I'm then faced with, how do I pull it back to a place where it feels finished? Uh, that's a really great challenge for me. It's fun. I noticed in some of them that you have like some metallics and golds mixed in with your pores. How did you get those in there? Um, just watercolor, just uh, gold watercolor. Yeah, sometimes I like, you know, mica. I love mica. Just that little bit of shimmer I feel like that you see in rocks and sandstone when you're out. Um, so I do that. And then sometimes I like to add little nuggets that are more, the, the harder areas that are more nugget-like. Um, are just acrylic paints too. There's acrylic in all of these. Sometimes there's the watercolor pour doesn't uh, fit up against something correctly, S or I want to complete the piece out this way. So like here, I took this whole section, and that right there is acrylic paint. So then the the challenge for me in the studio is how do I make this area look as satisfying as this magic that happened? So um, Again, as a painter, that's a fun challenge, is to, to find ways to manipulate the paint. All right. So my question is, where is your next residency going to be? Uh, <laughs> I actually, I'm actually kind of glad to be home. OK. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, I, don't have, I don't have anything scheduled. I was looking at this summer and almost applying for things, but I also, I do have a painting studio at home and I can use a painting studio up in uh, Loso here too, in 210 to really make big space. So I, I, d I think I'm gonna take a year off so that I'm not totally gluttonous with it, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank well, you so much. Thank you, yeah. yeah.